Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to give everybody just a second to join and then we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started. Thank you everybody for joining us today um, for this session on researching and writing uh, for national, the National Park Services Network to Freedom Program. And thank you to all of our speakers for being here today. You see we have a fantastic panel lined up for you. Um, my name is Jessica Felt and I'm the Preservation Initiatives Manager at Preservation Maryland. Uh, just wanna do a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, this webinar is part of our series that we've been presenting throughout the year. Um, as you know, we had to cancel our annual Old Line State Summit uh, due to COVID. So we have been doing webinars uh, throughout the year um, to provide educational opportunities. Um, and we do have uh, information and recordings of past webinars um, on our website. At uh, It's actually, you can find them at oldlinestatesummit.org. Um, and this also includes our previous summer session on the Underground Railroad um, that we presented, uh, about, I think, two months ago. Um, and if you have not already viewed that, um, we hope you'll check that out as well. It kind of serves as a, um, a lot of good background on the program um, that can then help uh, with this one as well. So I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Whiting Turner, the Maryland Historical Trust, Worcester Eisenbrandt, Brennan and Company, and the Middendorf Foundation. Uh, the support of these sponsors uh, enables us to present these programs free of charge, and we really do thank them for their support. Um, and so we do have our wonderful panel of speakers today. Uh, we are going to be starting with Heather Ertz, who is the uh, Partnership and Outreach Manager for the Maryland Office of Tourism Develop Development. Then we're going to go to Diane Miller, National Program Manager, and Kamal McLaren, Region 1 Program Manager for Network to Freedom. And Region 1 does include Maryland, so that's uh, why Kamal is on here today. Uh, that is his region. Um, so next will be Christopher Haley, the Supervising Research Archivist uh, for the Study of Legacy of Slavery in Maryland at the Maryland State Archives. And finally, we will hear from Maya Davis, who is the Research Archivist and Legislative Liaison for the Maryland State Archives. So thank you to all of our panelists for being here. Um, and the last thing before we go ahead and get into the meat of the session is I just want to go over how you can ask questions. We are going to have time allotted at the end for Q&A. Um, and the, you can enter your questions into the question box at any point. Um, and then we will be asking them at the end of the session. So um, if something comes to you, don't be shy. Go ahead and, answer, and put it into the question box at that time uh, as it comes to you. Um, so I am going to, without further ado, I start sharing our my screen. Oh, wrong presentation up though. That's Maya's. Let me pull up Heather's. There we go. And Heather, I'm going to give you control of the presentation. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, so um, it's my pleasure to be here from the Maryland Office of Tourism and to be working with my colleagues who I work closely with and uh, that are here to help you uh, with your Network to Freedom applications. So one question is that we get, am I get to advance? Come on, there we go. Is why is the Maryland Office of Tourism working with the Network to Freedom program for, I had one slide in there, there we go. Um, why, why are we supporting this? Why, why are we involved? And the reason we are involved is because when the Network to Freedom program uh, 
makes a site, a, a takes a underground railroad site program or a research facility, it goes through a process of being vetted through the National Park Service. We then at the Maryland Office of Tourism can turn around and market that program. And these are important for us because uh, Maryland has an incredible underground railroad story. Uh, and we are really marketing ourselves as one of our initiatives with Maryland as the most powerful underground railroad storytelling destination in the world. And part of that is that we have the most documented success, successful escapes utilizing the Underground Railroad. We had had the most part National Park Service Network to Freedom sites. We've just been surpassed by Ohio in the last round. So uh, we've had to take that uh, justification down now a little bit and uh, are very much interested in getting regaining that uh, as part of our, our reasoning as having the most. And then Maryland is home to renowned renowned freedom fighters, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Henry Highland Garnett, William Stills family is from here, as well as many, many other stories um, that are so important to get out to the public. Um, benefits, Why? what are the benefits of becoming a National Park uh, Service Network to Freedom site in Maryland? Uh, on the Visit Maryland website, we have a section des designated specifically for this program and getting people to those sites. Uh, it has a map, interactive map. It has information of each one. Each site has a business listing, and we are heading towards a project that each of the um, business or each of the listings will have a uh, curated Google business listing, which we'll be working with uh, in the spring, the spring coming forward. The other benefits are that as part of that site, we have a lovely um, intro video about exploring Maryland's Underground Railroad and Network to Freedom. It goes into the history of the Underground Railroad here in Maryland, as well as um, highlights some of the stories, as well as, as highlights some sites. And uh, that was uh, benefited from a Network to Freedom grant. Uh, and then also we have a printed guide of all of the sites, again, more background information that is for our visitors. This goes specifically out to our visitor centers, is out, is mailed out as requested through our um, customer contact services and um, is available throughout the state and, and can be ordered. So we're here to market you. Um, and we market through a variety of ways. Uh, as you see with our products there, the website, the visitor guide, we also do a lot of advertising. These are two ads we just ran for International Underground Railroad Month. Um, the advertise, there's an advertising budget behind it. There are um, social media boosts, uh, funds for that, for boosting social media postings on our site, um, which, and then our social media team will amplify your sites also. So there's that benefit. There's also the benefit of, of being part of some of the initiatives coming from our office, such as International Underground Railroad Month. We started this two years ago. This past uh, year in 2020, we partnered with, um, with the Network of Freedom Program and with Michigan Freedom Commission and grew this program to be 11 states uh, and multiple uh, areas and towns uh, also proclaimed International Underground Railroad Month. And this will be something we will be continuing uh, in 2021 and really want to see this program continue to grow and become nationwide. So you'll be part of that marketing, uh, can be part of that whole initiative, the social media campaign that went with that. And as you can see here, we actually um, had that social media campaign we sent out to you to help you as a site, a program, a research facility, uh, amplify your messaging and be part of that larger messaging um, through social through the social media grounds. We are heading to uh, 2022, which is Harriet Tubman's uh, 200th anniversary or 200th birth year of her birth. And um, the goal for that is that Maryland have over 100 Network to Freedom sites as part of our collection. And so we hope you will join us uh, with that effort and um, I am super excited to hand this over now to Diane and the rest of the team to tell you how to go about doing your application so that the Maryland Office of Tourism can market you in the future. Looking forward to working with you all. Thank you so much, Heather. And give me one moment to pull up the Network to Freedom presentation and hand over, uh, not handing it over to you, Diane, I believe. Okay, it's all yours. You're on mute, Diane. 
Thanks. <laughs> I want to thank Preservation Maryland and the Maryland Tourism and the Maryland State Archives, which have been great partners with us over the years. Um, so before I talk about how to fill out the application, I want to just talk a little bit about what the applications are and what they're used for. Um, this is a kind of a large public history project where grassroots people all around the country are documenting their stories of the Underground Railroad. And collectively, we're growing a nationwide database and archives of stories of the Underground Railroad. And so we're trying to balance the inclusiveness of working with grassroots researchers and, and oral traditions with um, authenticity and documentation so that uh, we can answer critics that want to tell us about how the Underground Railroad was largely a myth and that sort of thing. So we're kind of striking this balance. Um, the applications, therefore, need to speak for themselves. Um, a lot of times people work with sites and stories that they are so deeply connected to that sometimes they forget that other people aren't as knowledgeable about all the facts and details. And so a lot of things sometimes get left out. So we wanna make sure that the applications really do justice to the story and, and tell the story to somebody who never has seen that site or knows about it. And this is going to be their opportunity to learn about that site. And so we want the applications to contain a narrative that would describe why the site is recognized by the network. All right. Now my controls are not working. Ah, okay. So there's certain general information that we look for on the network. I'm going to kind of go through some of the information questions that we ask and uh, give you some pointers that will help you avoid some of the pitfalls that we've seen in, in applications over the years. So the most important thing is to figure out whether you're a site or a facility or a program. And that sounds kind of obvious, but we really recommend that you talk with your regional coordinator so you'll get to know Kamal quite well um, to determine whether what you're, you're in the right category. Um, we want to list the historic names of the site, not the name of your organization um, or a current name of the property. We're looking for the historic name. So one of the most important pieces of the application is the summary. It's meant to be 200 words. This is what will show up on our website when people look for information about your site. This is what will come up on our interactive map when people click on your site. So you really want this to be as clear as possible to describe what the association is with the Underground Railroad of that site and or program and what evidence do you have to support that? You could say, this is a site that someone escaped from and we know that because there are runaway ads or this was a, a place that sheltered people and we know because there are diaries or letters or whatever the case, just really clearly state that at the beginning and that should help you focus your application. Um, so we don't, want to see there the, the information about the organization that might manage that or own that property. There are other places to put that kind of information. So really focus in on what the most important points are. So I'm gonna go through the site applications first. Uh, this is gonna be such a quick run through, but these slides are um, available, will be available as a handout and this information is also on our website. So for sites, um, we ask for sort of framing questions. What kind of site is it? Is it listed in the National Register? Who owns it? Is it owned by a local government or a nonprofit or what have you? And then what is the Underground Railroad Association? So you can select the ones that fit best. Um, you only need to have one <laughs> association, so don't get too uh, click happy, but you'll need to 
uh, address all of those different associations in your narrative to explain how it's associated as a destination or a transportation route or what have you. We do require for sites photographs that show the site as it currently is. What is it that we're nominating? What do you look at, at if you go there and see it on the ground? And you know, if there are historic photographs, those are great. Um, the photographs that you send to us should be copy free so that we can use them. Um, and maps are really important to show the location of the site and uh, how it relates to other things in the area. Um, ownership category, I will mention that some sites are have multiple owners, but we do require a letter of consent for each owner. So um, if you check that it's got a nonprofit and a state owner, you need we need a letter from to represent each of those categories. So the heart of the application is the narrative, the essay that talks about what is the Underground Railroad Association and how do we know. Um, it's really important to make this a, a succinct and sort of well-argued clear story so that people that don't know the site will be able to understand it. We do require that the narratives have citations that will be able will allow a reader to track down that information um, many times people want to use those uh, footnotes and citations to um, follow a, a research point that they can then take off uh, in a different direction with their own research so those footnote citations are really important and then the next important question um, in our site application is what is the history of the site since the Underground Railroad? And it's really important that you describe what the site looks like today. Um, I can tell you over the years we've had many applications come through where it's not really clear that what you're looking at today is actually the third building on the site and the one where all the his history happened um, burned down 100 years ago. So it's real important to just give an overview of what's happened, what it looks like, what you're including in the um, application. Um, we don't need a chain of title or anything. We don't need to know every owner that ever had it, but if it you know, was a residence for 150 years and then it became a, a church or something or vice versa, just kind of make, note those big changes uh, in use of the property. So another really, really important piece of information that we ask for is the bibliography. So we really, this needs to support the citations and the narrative in S4. And you'll need to um, actually do a bibliographic entry for each um, source that you used. Um, you can, it's helpful to separate primary and secondary sources, and it's helpful as well if you have sources that are not well known to maybe talk a little bit about how you use that source, what kind of information is in it, whether or not it's reliable, and that will really help bolster your application. And if you're using primary documents, it's, it's helpful if you can tell us where they were found. Um, and, you know, sometimes documents are still in the hands of the family. So um, that's useful to know. And if it's a document that's not readily available to the public, having, you know, a copy of it would be helpful as well. So facility and programs. Um, Another category that we we consider, and it's a little awkward, I would say, for the National Park Service as a land management, land place-based agency to think about evaluating interpretive programs and research facilities. Uh, we know that many of these things are community-based, they're volunteer efforts, and they don't 
have paid staff many times and they don't necessarily have um, people with degrees working at them or running them. And so we, but we want to be able to include those types of places. So we focus our questions around um, looking for qualities that we're um, seeking rather than credentials. So we want to make sure that the information presented is accurate. That's why we ask for sources of your information. We want to make sure that there's an, a professional approach to how the exhibit or the program was put together or how the facility is run, um, that the presentations and the interpretation that the Network to Freedom is putting its sort of good housekeeping seal of approval on is um, reflective of the quality of, of history that we're looking for. And we have sometimes gotten requests to consider a program that's not yet operational, like a tour that somebody's putting together that they're going to do, you know, the next spring. But we require that the program has to be in existence, has to have tour has to have been done before uh, the um, facility has to have been opened. So there has to be some kind of history of operation. Um, facilities have to be accessible to the public. It doesn't really do much good to have a research facility that nobody's allowed to use. And we do have research centers as a category, and I don't know if we have any of these that have ever been nominated, but they would be a place where um, the staff is putting together curated information about um, the resources and using the documents and things there. So for facilities, what we're trying to do here is let people know that if they are trying to research the Underground Railroad in a certain community that they could go to this place and find some information that would be helpful. So we're really trying to get a, a sense of what is in that facility. We have many local libraries, historical societies, state archives, um, state libraries from very small to very large facilities. Um, but we want to know what is the information that people will go. If they made a trip across the country to come to this facility, what would they find there? Is there information that is helpful and you know specific to researching the Underground Railroad? So that's not going to be you know like a handful of Underground Railroad diaries, but it's going to be the kind of information that you'll learn about from the Maryland State Archives, those sorts of things. Um, so what's also really important about facilities is that there be some kind of a finding aid that would help people um, look through the material because if you can't, if it's not indexed in some kind of way, it doesn't really exist. It might as well not really be there. So we're just trying to help people get connected to the information that they're looking for. Um, so a, a thing about programs is that we want to make sure that they are grounded in solid research, that they, uh, they've been developed in consultation with the community that they're in, with descendants, if there are descendants, that sort of thing. So we ask for uh, letters uh, from people that you've consulted with. Um, and we also uh, request that Programs have a system for evaluate, evaluation so that feedback from the user and the um, participant gets looped into improving the program over time. Um, so we do want to see, um, sometimes people have a feedback form they give at the end of a tour, that sort of thing. So, so uh, showing us an example, talk about how you use that information. Um, one thing that's important with the programs, and it sounds obvious, but I can hear in my head uh, one of my former colleagues talking about describe, 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 because sometimes we don't, we can't get a sense of what is this program. Um, and then the other really important piece is what is the Underground Railroad information that a participant in that program is going to get out of it? What do you want them to take away um, about the 
um, strain on families that, for people that had to decide whether or not they're going or you know whatever that might be um, really give us some information about what the objective is for that uh, learning and teaching and we really again are interested that it's based on solid information you know we've had many Harriet Tubman programs submitted to us over the years where the primary sources were children's books and that just really isn't going to be sufficient. So I'm going to turn this over to my colleague Kamal and he's going to tell you uh, about the process of working with us for a nomination. All right, good afternoon everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us on this webinar and thank you Diane. I'm trying to give, uh, try to waste a little bit of time so that it'll register so I can actually uh, proceed forward. Um, so You're, today- You had control. Oh, okay, perfect, perfect. So today I, I really just wanted to um, get at the idea of, you know, what is the process because everybody um, is willing to submit um, their quote unquote potential uh, applications for uh, the Network to Freedom, but then they say, okay, well, once I submit it, what, what happens after that? Um, or even what, you know, what happens if I have one, um, you know, potential application that could be, uh, added into the network and you know where do I go from there so and we try to answer that question for you and what we do is uh like you guys know I'm I'll, I'll be your regional coordinator for this area and um, what I'll try to do is if you uh reach out to me through email or by phone or if your contact information is passed on to me what I like to do is uh introduce myself as your regional coordinator and you know look at me as uh being your your advocate when it's time to uh submit your application for the uh, review process and uh, so the, the way to really begin this process is to uh, reach out to your regional coordinator, uh, be it uh, Northeast region, Southwest or Midwest. Uh, we all have uh, our quote unquote jurisdiction, if, if, if you say. And so I'll be your um, coordinator from all the way up to Maine down uh, to our area here. And it even extends a little bit further west. But uh, what I'll do is I'll meet with you. We'll set up like a formal um, meeting with one another and we'll go through the actual process itself. Um, we'll try to talk about the scope of your actual um, application. And like uh, Diane uh, reiterated earlier, I will sort of try to uh, make sure that you don't make those pitfalls because what we wanna do is uh, have you guys submit a strong uh, application package when it's time for review. And what we'll do is we'll set up a timeline. We'll decide which uh, round that you wanna actually uh, submit, it, uh, submit it to. And we pretty much uh, review applications every six months. And we have uh, two quote unquote application deadlines. One is uh, January um, 15th and then the other is July 15th. And what we do is we like to sort of meticulously work with you through that process. And um, so the next thing is, as we're working through this process, I'll be answering your technical questions. If you have any questions about uh, the questions on the application, uh, sources that you might need to use, or even just uh, wrapping your, your mind around the, the true association to, to the quote unquote network for the application to be approved. So the next step is um, the actual review process. And we like to sort of uh, hone in on, you know, six distinctive um, application uh, steps. And when you submit your, your review. So as I stated earlier, that uh, we pretty much uh, receive applications every six months. And those uh, deadlines are uh, January 15th and July 15th. And uh, unfortunately, we ask if you submit a uh, application package after those, those deadlines, then it'll pretty much be considered for the next round. And then the next step really begins with uh, the applications are reviewed for required materials. So all the things that Diane was talking about, those are the materials that you're getting, your bibliographies, your um, your sources, answering your questions, putting all the pertinent information uh, in, into those applications. So what, what you'll do is you'll submit the, that to us or particularly for me, and hopefully um, everything will be as in a military uh, term, dress right, dress by the time it's submitted uh, on January 15th or July um, 15th, because I'll be working with you through that process. But um, so it will be like sort of that second time around of me actually making sure you have your package is solid and ready to go um, for the for the second step. 
Then the uh, third step is applications um, for consideration. Um, what we do is we begin that process with an application release. So notice of your application uh, that will be under consideration will be uh, posted on our website. And then the notice will include, you know, the element title, state, and nomination type, that pertinent information that she wants, uh, that Diane stressed uh, in the summary. And then what we'll do is um, take and review that for about 30 days. And then after the 30 day process, hold on, let's see. Sorry about that. Let me go back. So then uh, that'll be about 30 days. And uh, the public can, um, can and also encourage uh, some feedback input uh, under, under your application that's being considered. Uh, so, and the public can submit comments and those comments actually will come directly uh, to me. And then what I'll do is I will probably uh, get with you and work with the application to make those edits. And then the uh, step four uh, begins with the uh, review of the committee and we, we sort of meet, we vote on the applications and the uh, review committee, if you wanna know, is really comprised of uh, Network to Freedom staff um, and then uh, reviewers, other reviewers outside of uh, our uh, network. And uh, we also ask other uh, individuals to participate and it, they can range, it can vary. And, um, and then we vote on new applications about 60 days um, after the submission deadline to determine uh, those who, who will be accepted in the actual uh, network. And then what I will do is the, the regional manager, uh, myself and other regional managers uh, will present an application to the committee and then which will vote on it, whether it uh, is recommended or not recommended uh, for inclusion. And then the step five uh, begins with when uh, applicants inducted are notified. So the committee uh, approved applications will be added to the network and uh, the National Park Service will notify the applicant. Usually it'll be notified uh, in a formal manner by, uh, by Diane, uh, Diane. And uh, those uh, applications, um, you'll receive a letter in the mail and then you will pretty much along with that letter, it would allow you, you know, talk about the benefits, um, which Heather talked about earlier. And it'll also um, give you permission to actually use the network logo. And it'll also uh, give you guidance on the guidelines on how um, that logo uh, should be used. And then this, uh, the final and sixth step, that really pertains to those that uh, really did not um, submit a strong package. So that step begins when applicants are not uh, inducted or notified and receive suggestions. So what I'll do is I will we'll go back to square one because the like I said, you got to look at the regional um, coordinators such as myself and others as sort of your advocate. So we, the, the goal is to make sure and hope that we can eventually get it over the finish line to get accepted into the to the network. So um, if you didn't um, get inducted the first time around, we'll definitely make preparations for the next round. And what we'll do is we'll just strengthen that application and, uh, and get it ready for the next round. And then we'll continue to start that whole process all over again. And that's pretty much the, the process. Uh, all, of, all the information is on our uh, website. And, um, and I'm definitely looking forward to uh, looking for, uh, forward to working with you guys and, uh, and actually meeting you guys uh, in terms of uh, submitting some uh, applications to, to the network. Thank you so much, Kamal. We really appreciate it. And thank you too to Diane. We really appreciate both of you um, coming in to share your information about the program. Um, we're now going to turn it over to the Maryland State Archives to talk a little bit about how uh, to research uh, for, for some of these things. We're going to start with uh, Chris Haley and give me one moment to switch around the presentation and hand you controls. Okay. And. You now have control. Take it away. We're off. <laughs> Thank you, President Race Maryland, Jessica, Kamal, Heather, Diane, and my colleague, Maya Davis, and all of you who are out there uh, watching us today. Uh, it is certainly an honor to be a part of the Network to Freedom National Park Service. This is something that our program became uh, cherished, <laughs> or as I said, to be a part of back in about 2001, I believe primarily because as I click to see if I can move it to the next slide, I made a special. It began with the help of volunteers. I was deputy director of the reference services at the Maryland State Archives located in Annapolis 
And one volunteer named Jerry Henson came to me, Jerry Henson, H-Y-N-S-O-N, came to me with a documentation of an Aaron Salisbury. And it said that Aaron Salisbury, I'm talking about not moving, the, just so you know, Jessica, I have clicked it a couple of times. Uh, but, but, ah, I, I, okay, that, that's our website right here, Legacy of Slavery in Maryland. So that's where you would want to go to get a general our program is today and what it has been in the past and what we hope to maintain in the future. But again, uh, Jerry Henson came to me with this, this criminal citation uh, accusation of an Aaron Salisbury who was, who was accused of aiding and abetting someone to escape. Now, of course, as we know, the Underground Railroad is underground for a reason. It was not something that people openly talked about because it was against the law for someone to help someone escape enslavement. So you're breaking the law in doing this. So this network to freedom was something that was necessarily covert. So in seeing this, this uh, citation that Jerry brought to my attention, I thought this might be something that could lend itself to evidence of the Underground Railroad because this person was aiding and abetting someone to escape, but certainly not yelling or shouting from uh, from the skies, come follow me. I'm a part of their Holy Ground Railroad. So that began us on this journey. And the journey has taken us since 2001 all the way through the current years, which is approximately 20 years right now, where we primarily look at runaway ads from newspapers. We also look at census records, federal censuses from the core years of 1830 to 1880. The reason we look at those years is because we're trying to get a sense of sort of the antebellum years of when, when uh, perhaps the, the, there was an increased measure of agitation both for and against slavery, which precipitated persons really pushing to, to try to seek their freedom leading up to the Civil War and also following the Civil War when we go to the, the census of 1870 and 1880, because we want to know where people migrated to. Did they stay in the same area where they found freedom or did they move elsewhere? Did they leave Maryland because of course we're focused on Maryland specifically, or did they go to other areas where they did not live in a, an enslaved life, a life of bondage? So that's why we focused around those years. So if we can go to the next slide, I will click on it and see if I, if I have control, then it would have moved by now. Perhaps I don't, Jessica. Uh, so give it one more click. When I had to uh, mute myself, it, it handed back to me. So let me uh, mute and then try one more time. Okay. Okay, and again. And once more the feeling. <laughs> Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, you see all the different, uh, our origin of the research on individuals fighting against enslavement and slavery in Maryland. And in this paragraph here, you see project beginnings, and it speaks about what I just was said to you about Jerry Henson. The original concept was to discover unknown heroes of the Underground Railroad. It's, and it's, it's not just about our native sons and daughters being Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. It's about all those other individuals who also helped people, such as Aaron Salisbury, find freedom. And again, as it mentions between 1830 and 1880, how they had to do this, risking their lives and the lives of others, whether they were already free, whether they were white, whether they were black, they were taking this, their own freedom in their in their hands by helping somebody else so those are some of the categories that we have here the methodology how we went about this how we think that you yourself could try to to facilitate and to fill the the categories that diane and kamal mentioned earlier and trying to to put forth a successful nomination to the uh, network to freedom and also how you in whatever it's a program or if it's a site or, or research facilities such as we are, how you'd be able to look inside of what you have at your beck and call, so to speak, or within your research, research, your foundation to offer others, such of you who are watching us today, that we can help you put forth a very sound and solid uh, presentation. Uh, next slide, please. I mean, well, let me see, dot, dot. Oh, I'm gonna go back one if I can. 
Okay, uh, one of the things that we have tried to do as much as resources have allowed is that we have tried to touch upon every jurisdiction within the state of Maryland. As you see, the ones here that are highlighted in blue, those are the ones that we actually have a certain number of case studies, we call them, that have been completed. If, they're, if it's still in black, it has not been highlighted, that means that we probably have not specifically been accorded the or, or afforded funds to put a specific study on Carroll County, Garrett County, Wacomico, uh, Calvert County, or what have you. That said, many of these cross-reference, many of the references that you'll find in Charles County or Prince George's County or Anne Arundel County will find references within Calvert County. I myself have given many presentations in Calvert County which relate to the Underground Railroad and persons who have, have sought freedom and have been found in some of these records, which I'm going to speak about. Primarily, our categories here are fugitives, accomplices, slaveholders, and other. Other being places where we, we believe Underground Railroad activity or stories of flight, as we call them, may have taken place. And those are the type of, of, of things that runaway ads or, or domestic traffic notices or, or a, accounts of incidents will reveal to you the possibility that Underground Railroad activity took place. So as you see there, depending on where you're, you're watching us from, we do have information on several of these counties, including Baltimore City, where we believe, where we have information either from primary documents such as runaway ads, domestic traffic ads, court cases, and or newspapers, uh, and the federal census that I mentioned. Okay, for instance, here are many of the types of records that we have mined over the years at the Maryland State Archives that relate to African Americans. Accommodation dockets, assessments, census, certificates of freedom, chattels, deserters, domestic traffic ads, as I mentioned, inventories, manumissions, military service, pardon dockets, pardon records, Maryland penitentiary, penitentiary et cetera. The brief descriptions are there as well. I won't go into all of them because I, we certainly want to give you a time to ask us questions as well before the presentation time is over. But specifically, let's talk about certificates of freedom, which is something that a person would have whether they were born free or subsequently attain their freedom. It's the equivalent, one could say, of a of a driver's license. You, you have this because you have learned how to drive, but you needed proof where if someone stops you because you've, I mean, in our current day, if you pass the stoplight without stopping, do you have the right to even be driving? Well, at this point, if someone stopped you back in 1850, and you were in Anne Arundel County and someone stopped you and they could say, why you're by yourself, are you free Are you or are you enslaved? Your certificate of freedom is a document that would describe you very specifically, your height, your weight, if you had any scars, and that would be beholden to that person to accept as being proof that you, yes, you actually are a free person and you have the right to be on your own wherever you might be. A manumission is a document like that, except for the fact that a manumission is a document that actually freed the individual. Manumissions can also be found within wills or they can be found within land records, but there are a series of records specifically under that title that we also have as well. Domestic traffic ads, those are the type since those are the type ads which I think I have one to show you too, which will show you where 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 people were sold. So those would be locations where, if someone in Baltimore City or someone in Charles County or Anne Arundel County or where have you, where sales of enslaved individuals were actually conducted, you would see such ads there put before you as well. Let me click once. Okay, just for example, if Frederick County is one, one of our jurisdictions. So for example here, we have conducted much research in this specific jurisdiction 
we have runaway ads, 460 runaway ads. So as Diane mentioned earlier, that's the type of document that once was found in the newspaper, which would indicate not only the individual who ran away, it would indicate the person from whom they ran, and it would indicate any suggestions or any ideas about where the person or persons may have been running to, or who may have helped that individual within their effort to escape, which is to say, if someone ran away, and see the first one here says, an 18 year old boy runs, runs away, his name is Perry, and he ran away from an owner whose name is Abraham Simmons. So if, for instance, someone else runs away from Abraham Simmons at that same time, and Abraham Simmons is within this runaway ad, he suggests that Perry is trying to get to his father or his mother or, or some other relative in another part of Frederick County or in a part of Charles County or in, or in Pennsylvania. And he mentions the name of another individual who might have helped him attain this, this measure, measure of freedom. Then that person, that, that indication that they may have gone from Frederick County to Pennsylvania is an indication that there was help, that there was a assisted flight to facilitate this person, Perry's escape. And if you are able to find a pattern of that, and if you're able to find a pattern to to sources or to routes, then that's the type of suggestions that I think th that help facilitate a nomination, especially if it indicates an area or a place to whence they they migrated or where they where the the person who has placed the the ad claims the person is running to. And you see for at this point, there's 460 of them, uh, the different individuals, we have them by name, we have the owner's name, and we also have the location of the owner of the from which the person ran away. One more click here. One of the things we also wanted to check as far as domestic traffic ads, as, as long as we're looking at runaway ads as well, is just different time frames and just see just to look for similarities. Here I put in 1837 because one of the individuals in the earlier in the earlier ads had mentioned that they were that they had run away around 1840. So I'm looking to see if in these ads of 1837 was there someone who had an approximate age that corresponded to the age of a runaway ad in 1840. So I was looking for all these several uh, 1837 ads to see if there's that possibility. And again, if there is that possibility, if there is that similarity, then that's the type of thing that that presents a a possible connection or a possible clue as to how this this path or this route or individuals were were complicit in a positive way to help this person escape. So that's part of one of the other ideas. That, that one can use if you're trying to find within your nomination certification, verification, uh, support for the possibilities that this rumor that you heard from childhood where my, my great grandfather's place and my great grandmother's place or that, that old church was a site on the Underground Railroad. Click again. Okay, here's an example of a domestic traffic ad, as I said, 1837 slave advertisement. The highest price in cash will be given for 40 servants of different ages, slaves for life of 10 to 30 years of age. Liberal commissions will be will be given for information. The site of this sale was Mr. T I think it's me at Mount Talbot City Hotel. That means that's where Jeremiah Collins was. So just for instance, if for instance one was to find a runaway ad, a fugitive slave ad, where someone says, a Jeremiah Collins says that my enslaved person or my property was, I bought this person at Talbot City Hotel. And then there's a runaway ad that says that a, we believe this person escaped from Talbot City Hotel and he was aided and abetted by blah, 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 you know, Aaron Salisbury. 
then that gives you an idea about a possibility of where there was an activity going on, which is to say someone who's a who's an agent on the Underground Railroad, perhaps, or even if they're working on their own accord, is, is knowledgeable of the fact that people are being sold at Talbot City Hotel. So I will look there to see who these, who these individuals are, and then if opportunity presents itself, I will try to help those persons escape. Those are the type of things that, that can lend themselves to, to putting forth a nomination for a site. I hope I went in the right direction. And this is, again, showing some different individuals who in 1837 ran away. So the possibility is, were any of these individuals in Frederick County, were they a part of the 40 individuals who, who were a part of that domestic traffic sale? Did any of these individuals who were sold or bought at that time, did they subsequently escape and, and this is notice of their, their escape. There's only six of them there. So that's something that would be a possibility that one would look into by reading these runaway ads very specifically to see where the notations are of sites. Here's an example of a site that one of our, one of our first volunteers looked at because he believed that the references represented a site where Underground Railroad activity uh, may have occurred. Emmanuel Episcopal Church in Cumberland, so that's Allegheny County. It exists today. Uh, there was a visit that that this volunteer took many years ago, and I also went there in person because it's around or it's in the proximity of of the Ohio Valley, of, the, of Fort Cumberland, and it's the it's in the vicinity of the of the Underground Railroad. He thought because there's a sextant here whose name is, I don't know if I can move it down right now. I can't move this because this is a screenshot. Who he believed, or the story goes, would ring the bell when it was safe to actually escape under from the tunnel beneath this church. Now we have not been able to, to actually confirm that this is a case, uh, that this is actually a site, but we feel that Within this area, uh, at the the canal where people who were both free and enslaved worked, there could not have been the assumption that every person who was black was enslaved. So there's a possibility that you could quote unquote hide in plain sight and then go further north and then achieve your your full freedom. I was able to look subsequent to this and find five or six runaway ads where this approximate area was mentioned as being referenced as where a person ran from being in this ohio valley uh th this canal area so there is a possibility that this that the chesapeake and ohio canal really was an area where underground railroad activity or just assisted flight did occur now we haven't confirmed that as yet, but that, but that, this is one of the possibilities of a site that was put forth years ago by one of our volunteers. Samuel Jensen is the person that I mentioned. He was a formerly a runaway from Vicksburg, Mississippi, as this case study shows, and it is believed, again, the story has it, that he would ring the bell twice, and that would indicate that it was fine for the enslaved individual to run through the canal for freedom. So that's part of the the story behind this um, this site of the Emanuel Church. Another possibility that we had was we researched back in 2002. So we had just really begun this program in 2002. We looked at the uh, Edmondson House in East Newmarket, Dorchester County. A a colleague of ours who was who worked really in our IT department had heard from a friend of his that he believed that this Edmondson house was a site on the Underground Railroad because he believed there was a tunnel in the backyard of this area. So the colleague, myself, and another colleague ventured out to this, this, this site, this home, and we looked at it. We could not find the, the tunnel. There was some growth there, which, which was a bump in the backyard, which perhaps could have been where a tunnel was, was located years ago but this is back in around the 1830s or antebellum years of our study, quite frankly. 
So we couldn't tell, we couldn't tell for sure. But we looked around the outs, outskirts, could not find a tunnel specifically, but within going into this old house, we went to the second floor. Within the second floor, there was a room uh, off to the left as you approach the top of the steps, which was a wide open room. Now, wide open room now because the, the furniture has largely been moved, but they had, the owners of the home had spent some time getting ready to repaint the walls and in, in carving down the, the layer of paint that was there already, they found many signatures. And of these many signatures, what we found, my colleagues and I found, were the names of individuals who were from Southern towns approximately to the 1830s and from cities such as Charleston, South Carolina or Columbus, Georgia. And so what we came to believe was not indeed that this was a site on the Underground Railroad, but to the exact opposite, that this was a facility where enslaved people were probably sold from Maryland to places further south. So if you're talking about a situation where a 360 degree turn from what you believe is or what you believe and hope is reality to what the um, research shows, that's what happened in this case. So fortunately, we are that that area that that home has been preserved, it's been renovated. Uh, myself and Maya just met with the owners within the last couple of months and they have now put plexiglass over those walls. It is a private facility, so I'm not saying that's something you can all go visit because it's a private facility, a private home. But so there is, pre that, that those signatures are preserved. They are available on our website. You can actually see them on images that we took then. So that perhaps in the future we can check and see if indeed these individuals did sell enslaved Africans, enslaved blacks to, per, to places further south and, and find out what its history actually is. But that's an example of, of one site where the reality has turned out to be very different and the other site, the Emanuel Church, where we believe it, it supports a network to freedom nomination. This is an example of some of the handwriting that we found on the wall. James, uh, I think it's James Clunk, not really seeing that right, but Georgia, Upson County, 1835. Another one, Cary, uh, North Carolina. That's what's on the walls. Uh, this is our website, http colon forward slash slavery dot msa dot maryland dot gov. We have other over 400 bits of information at last count which Amaya right now will actually go further into what our website contains. And I think Jessica is going to give you the power now. Yes, yeah, I am. I am going to switch over one moment. And Maya, that first one, you're going to need to give it two clicks just to make sure it knows you are in control. And <laughs> Thank you. Hand that over to you right now. Okay. Hello, um, and thank you for having me this morning, um, well, this afternoon, really. My presentation will focus on records in our collections that will assist with crafting a National Park Service Network of Freedom application. Uh, let me first start by saying um, I do work at the Maryland State Archives, uh, which serves as the central depository for government records of permanent value. Um, its holdings date from Maryland's founding in 1634 and include colonial and state executive, legislative and judicial records, county probate, land and court records, church records, business records, state publications and reports. We also have a special collections department which houses uh, private papers, maps, photographs and newspapers, but I won't go so much into our special collections today as I will with our government records. Let me go back. Um, what I'll say is uh, the process uh, for us working with applicants for the Network of Freedom uh, begins with a story related to a person, place, or event related to the Underground Railroad. Individuals usually start with baseline information about a site such as a historic home or cemetery or a reference that is connected with an escape or escape attempt that needs further documentation. Typically, individuals have identified and escaped through newspaper advertisements such as this one for Reverend James Pennington, who escaped from Frisbee Tillman 
in Washington County, Maryland. As you can see, his name was then James Pembroke and he took on an alias, uh, which we know today as Reverend James Pennington. Pennington also wrote a narrative, The Fugitive Blacksmith, or Events in the History of James W.C. Pennington, pastor of a Presbyterian church in New York, formerly a slave in the state of Maryland, which helps us to further document his life through his own words. And I'll move on from here and I'll show you that there are other sources such as uh, the publication by William Still, which contains uh, the narratives of numerous runaway slave uh, events that took place not only in Maryland, uh, but other uh, locales as well. Uh, his original publication, uh, his written papers are actually digitized and available online. Um, if you put in a Google search, you can find that information. And they pertain a lot of information, but it does not cover everything. There are still plenty of untold stories that need to be told, which is why we count on individuals like yourselves to actually complete these different application packages and help uh, give further interpretation to the legacy of slavery and the Underground Railroad in Maryland. So first we're gonna start by looking at the people. Um, as Chris stated earlier, um, we divide our groups of people into three different categories. Um, the first being freedom seekers. Um, we have kind of adopted uh, you know, the terminology that the National Park Service uses. We try not to call them fugitives so, so as to be sensitive to the individuals that were actually escaping. Um, here you see uh, familiar faces, Reverend Josiah Henson, uh, Henry Highland Garnett, Sandra Ringo Ward, um, who all escaped from uh, the state of Maryland. And so when you have your uh, documentation or your oral history tradition that you have, you wanna kind of figure out what that baseline information is uh, prior to you coming to the archives. Uh, the second group that we look at are the slaveholders, um, which, as you know, uh, given the circumstances of enslavement in the state of Maryland, we have to trace their lives through the records that were created um, by the individuals who owned them and were the policymakers for the state and uh, actually were responsible for how they were recorded in those records. Um, sometimes there's minimal information, sometimes there's great detail. Uh, what I tell patrons that come to the archives all the time is that the moment someone escapes, there's a great deal of detail uh, re related to who they are, uh, such as their last name, their first name, who they're related to, where they may be going, um, but it's the records uh, that they have while they're living at the site and working at the site um, that is very vague, it can be very vague in some of those early records. So we have that and then we also have our third and final um, class of individuals who are individuals who actually assisted with the flight to freedom and were accomplices and actually offered food, shelter and transportation for freedom seekers that were looking to uh, liberate themselves. Now we will look at the places. So see, um, what you see here is um, three different kinds of sites. Um, I like to cover uh, three different types of sites because sites uh, could mean a place where an enslaved individual uh, escaped, resided, or fled to. Um, and But then you also have a repository like the Maryland State Archives. We are a network to freedom. Uh, site. Um, we are a repository that houses records related to the flight to freedom, uh, and we have items in our collection that speak to the enslavement experience um, as well as the flight to freedom. Uh, the third site that you see here is the Banneker Douglas Museum, which is also a network to freedom site, and it's based on the programming and exhibitions that they have housed within their facility. And so this is a roundabout you know, experience of covering place in your application. Um, there's many sites in Maryland that I know have great resources related to the Underground Railroad, um, such as the NAB Center and other historical societies and things like that. that aren't currently in the network, but it will be a great addition um, because it helps to further tell the story and make accessible uh, records available to the public. So now I'm just going to kind of run through really quickly um, the process for accessing records in our collections and then cover uh, examples of different records in the collection. So typically, um, 
I direct people to our Guide to Government Records catalog, and that can be found from our homepage um, at MDSA, I type in MDSA.net, which will take you to the archives homepage. And typically when you come to this page, I recommend choosing display by series, because once you uh, choose that option, you will then be taken to an option that will allow you to select a jurisdiction. Um, your jurisdiction will be your county. Uh, in some instances, it'll be towns like Annapolis or College Park or Denton and Easton, who also were, you know, municipalities who had records for their county, um, for their city specific. And what happens when you select your jurisdiction is you will then be taken to an alphabetical listing of the records that we have in our holdings at the Maryland State Archives. Um, whether they're paper, microfilm, or whether they've been digitized, if there's a digital copy, you will be able to access it from home. Um, there are a large chunk of our records that are available from home, such as our certificates of freedom and manumissions, but there's many others where you would have to be in the physical archive to view it. And as we know with the pandemic, a lot of um, institutions have you know, had to cut back their services uh, and having visitors on site, but we do offer um, online ordering as well. Um, I won't dwell too much on newspaper ads, um, but typically this is what most applicants kind of start with. Um, there's two type of newspaper advertisements that I've seen kind of lend itself to the narrative. Uh, the first being the runaway slave advertisement that you're familiar with, which you'll see on the right, the $1,200 reward um, for several slaves that escaped. But another um, type of newspaper advertisement that is helpful to telling the story our commitment notices and commitment notices kind of help indicate whether um, and show that you know the runaway process is not always successful and it sometimes happens on multiple uh, attempts to try to escape. So it's a good um, source. It'll tell the name of the individual who they were owned by, and sometimes it'll say they're passing themselves off as a free person. But both um, newspaper advertisers, I think, give uh, great baseline information to kind of get you started and so you kind of have something to work with as you think about the government records that you're going to come and look at. Um, as you know, um, many African Americans kind of hit that brick wall uh, in doing their family genealogy and research um, with the census records. Many people talk about not being able to find anyone beyond uh, the 1870 census moving backwards. Um, when enslaved individuals were left off of the uh, U.S. Census, uh, there were the 1850 and 1860 slave schedules, which listed slave owners, and it listed their property by gender, age, and color, color being black and mulatto, um, but there were no names for the enslaved individuals. However, um, you know, if you're looking for runaway uh, slaves during that time, you can do a comparison between the two censuses to um, see what, uh, you know, a 10 year difference, you'll see the ages increase by 10 years. And so if there's anyone uh, missing, there's a potential that they could have been bought or sold um, somewhere else, or they could have run away. So it's nice to kind of just do a comparison to see what that slave population for any particular owner looks like over time. And um, sometimes, you know, like in the instance of like someone like Frederick Douglass, you, may see them on censuses in other states. So you kind of have to look around. We do have a copy of the census that we have digitized and made available on our archives computers. However, we don't have them digitized to look at online. But a website like Ancestry.com, um, which is a subscription website, or um, Family Search, which is a free subscription website, do have uh, census records there if you decide that you find them useful. Slave statistics. Um, slave statistics are essentially, um, I'll read off what it says here on the screen, a list of slaves owned as of November 1st, 1864, the date when the Constitution of 1864, uh, which abolished slavery in Maryland, took effect. It was the hope that the federal government would compensate former slaveholders. The General um, Assembly in 1867 authorized the compilation of records to establish slave ownership and the value of slave property. Um, the unfortunate part of this is that we do not have them for all the counties. All the counties were expected to report this information in 1864, 
Um, however, what you see before you is what has been transferred to the Maryland State Archives to date. Um, you see we have for Anne Arundel County, Carroll County, Frederick, Howard, Kent, Montgomery, Prince George's, St. Mary's. And recently, um, a patron who has actually been working with the Georgetown project um, related to the enslaved individuals who were sold into Louisiana discovered the Charles County slave statistics through a microfilm reel at the University of Maryland. So it's good to kind of know um, what other repositories hold similar records as well. So I, it's a very valuable um, record. And the reason I bring this up, um, and I'm going to use a individual who I found, Alcee Shorter, whose alias was Alcee Blanford. Um, he and his family escaped um, close to the Civil War and settled in Chemung County, uh, New York, in Elmira. And they had been gone probably since 1858 or so. And their owner in 1864 still claimed them um, in hopes of being compensated uh, for the slaves that he owned. And they had been gone for <laughs> about four, five, six years by that point. Um, but it's just kind of nice to see that, you know, you can kind of connect the documentation with the stories in other states to help flesh out the full story. Penitentiary records. Uh, penitentiary records are very helpful um, as they highlight individuals who have been arrested as runaways and also individuals who have been arrested as um, assisting runaways. Um, in the notes field, there's kind of unique information in that notes field and um, it tells more about the person and you can kind of see um, what through um, judgment records, uh, what ends up happening to these individuals and it, it can kind of be a very great resource. Um, the penitentiary record um, is very helpful to what we do. And probate records. Um, typically, when people look at probate records, they're looking at wills and inventories, uh, which will list out um, uh, how, you know, a, the deceased person wants to um, administer uh, their property after they're, they're expired. So, um, you'll see inventories. Uh, not everyone has a will, but everybody should have an inventory. Um, there have been incidents where we found a will and we have not found an inventory, but that is very rare. Um, there should always be an inventory um, that lists out the property of the deceased. And that's what you see on the screen now. Here's an example of an inventory on the right hand side where you see towards the bottom, you'll see a list um, of uh, a man, servant, Grafton and the names of the other enslaved individuals who are also listed on the estate inventory. Um, it, it's a great listing of a way to get names of individuals because as you know, when people escape, they do often leave behind family members uh, that tie into this story. But one of the underutilized probate records um, that I think is underutilized are um, distributions and accounts of sale. The distributions are usually how the slaves are divided up um, once the um, estate is settled. Um, one person that I think about in our distributions is Frederick Douglass. Um, when his owner, Aaron Anthony, died, uh, the distribution for his account, you could see how the family was divided amongst his children, uh, the children of Aaron Anthony. And then also in the accounts of sales, where from time to time uh, they're selling off uh, property, um, but sometimes they sell off the rights to an enslaved individual who ran away. So if they're selling off items from uh, a deceased individual's account to settle their debt, sometimes you will see individuals that are listed as a runaway and they sell that right to someone who's willing to take it on and attempt to track that person down. And land records. Um, land records are a great resource as well. You know, typically people think of land records and they think of land deeds and mortgages and things like that. However, land records do have bills of sale, uh, which kind of indicate, and manumissions, and in the bills of sale, I've seen things such as transfer of ownership for run runaway slaves. Frederick Douglass, again, being one of those individuals, um, long after he had escaped, his uh, owner, uh, Hugh All, transferred the ownership and his rights in uh, looking for Frederick Douglass through the land records to his brother. So you can look through land records. Sometimes it's not as easy and obvious in um, terms of indexing um, because you know that's just how things were recorded during the time. 
So, you know, I, we have to do like further due diligence and looking at the records and just making sure that we look as much as possible for the individual names and see what it is that they're exchanging in the land records. Um, that was like a great find. I just happened to see both all brothers' names mentioned in there. So I took a chance on it and just opened it up. Um, but it doesn't always say bill of sale or manumission in the index. Um, some counties are better than others. It's just going to be on a case by case basis. And chattel records. Uh, chattel records also um, sometimes contain bills of sale and manumissions. Um, and kind of work in the same way as land records is pretty much a transaction um, where you can kind of look and see. So the same similar information that you can find in manumission series, because there are separate manumission and certificate of um, freedom series for counties, but then there's also those that are held within chattel records and land records. And I'm going to close out looking at assessments. Um, an assessment is pretty much a evaluation tax document to show how much a person was worth. I think um, this is a great part of the story of flight and what people's skill sets were, why they were leaving, and just kind of paying attention to how much of a value they were to the person that owned them. Um, I'm going to wrap up here because I know that we only have a little bit of time and I want to give people time to ask questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maya. Uh, really appreciate it. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, that was fantastic. And yes, we would love to open this up for your questions. Um, so you do have how this works is you can type in your question um, and then uh, we will uh, ask, ask the panelists. Um, if something comes to you later, please feel free to reach out and email. Um, we did get one that was very nice, the fantastic information. Thank you. So um, we do have some comments some compliments in there. If anyone does have a question, I will start with um, with uh, the one question about, um, sorry, one moment. Um, is there a place that researchers can take a look at past successful applications um, to get uh, to get kind of a, a model for what to look at? Um. We do have most of the applications electronically. The best bet would be to talk to Kamal about what type of, of place you're trying to nominate, and he can uh, work to find one that is similar to what you're working on. So it'll kind of be comparable. Okay. And thanks, Diane. Um, that goes back to what, what uh, I guess what we were talking about earlier in the presentation is once we make that um, pre uh, meeting and we meet with each other and we understand what type of application, if it's a site, if it's a facility or program, then I will pretty much uh, assemble that type of application as a model and provide you with a toolkit to um, get, get you on your way and to get the process started and then I'll just work with you all the way through. Great, great question. Um, so, uh, and also one thing I forgot to mention is that we will have um, the presentation from Kamal and Diane on the email pat after the uh, after for the after session email as a attachment. So you will have all that information that they shared there as well. Um, so the other information, uh, the other question is just, and this is for everybody, anybody on the panel. Um, how often are you able to go visit sites, uh, either you know in the archives capacity or in the network to freedom capacity? Well, well, we archives. We were initially um, yeah. taking appointments, but given the COVID um, pandemic, you know, we've had to fluctuate. In the beginning, we weren't taking patron appointments, um, and then we began taking patron by appointment, but not open to a full uh, patron experience. Uh, with the recent climbing numbers, we have had to shut down our uh, patron appointments temporarily for now. And so right now it's a case by case basis. However, um, if they email our help desk uh, with any inquiries and things like that, they will direct it to the appropriate staff member. Um, and as it relates to this, uh, the application process, they can email Chris or myself. Um, they'll direct that to us. And if a applicant would like uh, one of the regional coordinators to um, 
I guess, uh, see a site, walk a site. Um, you know, due to COVID, we would definitely um, have to make uh, follow CDC guidelines and preparations. But um, I think once the, the numbers begin to uh, decline, we can probably set up some meetings and sort of practice the CDC guidelines. But everything is sort of hinging on uh, what trajectory the uh, COVID is going. You know, it sort of controls us. We don't control it. So. Mm -hmm. Jessica, I think you're muted. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> I do see a couple of raised hands. If you can go ahead and uh, type in your your question into the box, I can uh, ask that of the panelists. Um, so uh, another question is, how many apps are in progress? Um, are there gaps in locations or stories that the panelists uh, would be interested in seeing things um, come from? Diane, Kamal, you want to do the gaps or the numbers and I'll do gaps? Well, Kamal can give you a number how many of, that he's working with. So as of right now, I'm working with between uh, six and 10 applications, uh, some uh, that didn't make the last round. So we, I'm, I'm in, in that sort of a continued mode of working with them through the process. And, th and this is an outstanding great question uh, as well. And then uh, there's sort of, there's always leads. And then what we have to do is try to figure out um, first determine, you know, the scope of it, as well as at the same time, does it truly has it, do, does it truly have a, a direct, you know, association with the network? So it'll, it'll be, you know, uh, I don't want to say credible, but in other words, uh, it, it, we can start the actual process uh, rolling um, in terms of the application process, but between six and 10 uh, at this, at, at, the, at the moment, but uh, we're always looking for uh, new ones as well as uh, new leads. Yeah, and the new leads is an important, um, as we all, the, 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 the group of us work closely together and uh, and each, often each one of us gets a different lead and we'll share it with, with the others in the group and are really working on that kind of a, of a as a, a assistance group across the state uh, to help to help all of our sites and, and to our, our members who are trying to be members of the Network Freedom. Um, so if you talk to any one of us, we'll get you going with, the, you know, direct it in the right part of the process and, and keep you moving. Um, and then gaps. We very much have gaps of network freedom sites in Maryland. Uh, Western Maryland is very, very, has very few uh, network freedom sites at this point. Uh, Southern Maryland has a, a couple, but not nearly what is representative of the um, agriculture community that was in Southern Maryland and the, the number of um, self-emancipations that we know were coming out of, of Southern Maryland. So those are two areas that we're focused, or I'm focusing on, we're focusing on to, to, to try to get more applications from. The Eastern Shore is is well covered with so much of the work done with Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass at this point, just, just things that have rolled out of that. But um, I would say even the lower, lower Eastern Shore is, is lacking. So Anywhere across the state, um, we know that what has has struck me as as a historian coming into this project is is the number is is just the incredible number of individual stories that each one is important. Each one is 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 has something to um, provide to us today, and each one that is worth pursuing. So if you have an idea, have, have heard of a a possible oral history or just a kind of a you know a story in your community. We very much encourage you to to pursue that and um, to see what you can find and share it with all of us and and share it with share it with the world. Is what's incredible I, I about the like, program. I would like to suggest what I think is a gap is the areas close into D.C. We do have some listings in Montgomery County and Prince George's County, but there was pretty active networks going back and forth into D.C. And I don't think we have that really represented. And there's a, a story that I would love to see represented from Rockville. There was a group that left, I, I wanna say from Port Tobacco area. Um, there was a lot of people, they were coming up um, what's now Rockville Pike, uh, the Frederick Road. And there was an armed confrontation with local people. I think that is a really important story and it would be great to have a site related to that. 
I think I know which one you're talking about. If was it did it did it border three counties by any chance? Do you think, Diane? The, which Mark, one? William William. Oh gosh, Mark Caesar and something. It's also in Herbert Aptheker's book too. Is this was this <laughs> almost revolt? A rebellion? Yeah, I think it might have okay. been. I think that's what this is. That yeah, we have something on it, but no, we have. I don't. I know we have not been able to find a specific site yet. We have the courthouse, I think, of Port Tobacco, where they were. Some of them were tried, but I think that armed conflict is an important part of the story because the Underground Railroad is so romanticized. It's like, oh, everybody, of course, would help and you know do the right thing, what have you. But it was very contested. Right, and Mark Caesar and William Wheeler. I think those are the two names. Mm -hmm. So we have a question um, about the uh, legacy of slavery collections. Um, we had a question from someone who found some of the newspaper clippings um, hard to read, like a, a little illeg illegible for them. And so I was just wondering, she was wondering, is there another place, another online source where those can be, be viewed or post COVID, is there an in-person location um, to view those materials? Um, so what is available on our website? Um, some ads are much better than others, and it depends on what we have. Um, some newspapers, we only have microfilm copies. Sometimes those copies were not great um, when they were, you know, transferred to us. Um, sometimes, you know, we scan from original newspaper articles. So it just kind of depends on a case-by-case -case basis uh, what survives. And that's what I was going to kind of speak to in terms of the gaps, is that on a county-by-county -county basis, a lot of things um, that may survive in one county don't necessarily survive for other counties uh, due to things like courthouse fires and things like that. So it's kind of hard to tell um, the full story sometimes because of the gaps that exist in the uh, public record. Um, I would say, I mean, so many of the newspaper databases unfortunately have a, a paywall connected to them, um, but we do, uh, we use, platforms such as uh, Genealogy Bank. And then the public library has a newspaper archive that you could use your public library card to search newspapers. Uh, the Pratt Library has a copy of the Baltimore Sun, uh, which has a great number of uh, newspapers to actually view. And if you have a library card, and I think in the pandemic, many of the libraries are offering um, virtual library cards if you don't have a physical one. So that is an option to be able to use these uh, digital online sources. And it's not easy. I mean, people suggest, suggest in no way is it something that you should expect to, to to look at old and 19th century reading and think, oh, it's just me or whatever. It's some of it, it's very it's very challenging for Maya and myself and the rest of us on the panel to read some of this old, old handwriting. And and you can only get a little bit more, uh, I guess, familiar with it as you keep reading it and you start surmising what this means or or what what statements are indicating something else. Um, so we also have a question about, um, is there funding for either the writing of the applications or um, the preservation of the sites? And I can help with the second part of that, but um, I will take that question out to you. Diane, you want to start at the national level and we'll go to the state level? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Unfortunately, we do not have funding to um, have applications produced. We do sometimes have grant funding that can be used for preservation work or research or developing interpretation. Um, it hasn't been funded for many years, uh, mm -hmm. so we are you sometimes use um, scrape together a few pennies of operational funding to to fund some projects, but. We we do have a little bit available for that type of purpose. Yeah, and at the state level, there um, is not specifically money for uh, doing the research or writing the applications. Um, at we uh, at the state level, I have gone after some grants. Again, always looking for grants. Um, have only been su successful with one so far. Another area, though, would be your heritage area grants. Uh, mini grants are perfect. Probably a, a place to go for these uh, in our heritage areas. You have an interest in the heritage area uh, program. That's Maryland Heritage Areas Authority. You can look that up and see if your area, your site that you're researching, is in one of those heritage areas. Um, 
but we're all yeah it's it's unfortunate there's not for funds readily available so it's looking for grants looking for funding um it's something we're all all doing at all levels from the, from the very local to the very top <laughs> in the legacy of slavery department we've never had grant funding uh that focused on the application process our funding has been for summer internships to have individuals actually transcribe and digitize the records to make them accessible to the public to help support efforts like the Network to Freedom program. And right now that's only on a volunteer basis, so so yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just kind of chime in and say, so one of my other duties at Preservation Maryland is to manage our Heritage Fund grant program, um, which is a small grant program up to $10,000. Um, and we do have, so on the preservation end of that, uh, we do have um, some funding uh, there that is available. Uh, so at, our next round is in the spring. And so if you have any questions about that program, um, I would check that out. And also the state um, does have a couple grant programs. Uh, there is the, they have a capital grant program. Uh, so this is the Maryland Historical Trust, uh, the capital grant program, the non-capital grant program, and then also the, Afri the Commission on African American History and Culture also does have a grant program as well. So those are uh, usually kind of the big ones that I send people that are looking for grant funding on the preservation end to. Um, so if there are, if anyone has any last minute questions, um, but right now I think that we have answered what is in there. Um, I really, and actually that's kind of perfect timing because it's 2.30, so wonderful. Um, so thank you to our panelists for being here. Thank you to all of our attendees for being here and for the great questions. Um, if anything comes up, comes into your head, just please feel free to email us, email the panelists, um, and uh, we'd all, any of us would be happy to answer your questions. Uh, so we will be sending an email in the next couple of days that has a link to the video of this presentation. Um, as well as uh, the uh, presentation, a uh, PDF of the PD, uh, the presentation from Network to Freedom, um, and and some of the links that were have been coming up in the chat. If you didn't get a chance to grab them uh, during the session, so uh, please uh, thank you again so much for coming, and uh, please check out our website for any past sessions you may have missed, and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. The same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.